So this sermon is the story of why two years ago for Lent, I, a millennial, gave up Facebook. (laughs) And I never went back. Here's the thing. Our spiritual life, our growth in our relationship with God in Christ is predicated on our being able to abide. And I worry that if my own life is any indication, certain forms of technology, crucial to modern life as we know it now, and I'm not, the sermon is not saying we can, that it's possible to press rewind or to totally get rid of this stuff. That's impossible now. Certain forms of these technology have eroded our capacity to abide. John's gospel could not be clearer that those who abide in Jesus and Jesus in them bear much fruit and that apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. Pretty strong. It's even clearer in our reading from the first letter of John. First John is a short epistle towards the end of the New Testament. There are three letters of John, each shorter than the first. These likely emerge from the same community as John's gospel, and so they share certain theological themes. They were devoted to following the person, the apostle John, who's John's gospel calls the beloved disciple. First John shows us how Christian love really works. See, Christian love, or maybe we need to use the antique word charity that many of you would have learned either as Roman Catholics in Sunday school or going to Catholic school, or maybe, maybe we need the Latin caritas. I mean, we just need to differentiate this word love that First John's talking about from the way I love cheeseburgers and Mariah Carey. <laughs> Although that really is love, just a different form of it. Caritas is the spirit of Christ dwelling inside of you. It's God inside of you. The truest sort of love with which we can love one another, the love that John's gospel will go on to say just after where our reading this morning ended, is the love that leads you to lay down your life for your friends. That love just is the Holy Spirit. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Now, we mustn't think that we're cutting God down to size here, as if 1 John means to reduce God to the sentimental feeling I have when I'm being nice to someone. Instead, our understanding of love needs to grow up. Okay, It needs to thicken up. It needs to expand until we can see this sort of love as truly supernatural. That is, it is the essence of the triune God being poured into your heart and through you spilling out into the world as you love your neighbor. Now, my capacity to abide in Caritas has been seriously deteriorated by my smartphone and by the way that I have interacted with others on Facebook and Twitter. I want to say first, and I need to say this, that I appreciate that there are different forms of social media, okay, and they're not all created equal. And some of my concerns may not be relevant to all of them. I want to say, too, that social media has given us great goods, right, not least of which is the ability to stay in touch with those whom we love but don't live nearby. Friends from college, family from back home, folks from church. I mean, we at St. Mark's have really tried to make advantage of the gifts of social media in this regard, using Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on as ways to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and to keep us all connected one to another in this little local instantiation of the body of Christ. And I don't want to suggest that technology as such is a bad thing. That's just too easy. I mean, pen and paper are technologies, for crying out loud not to mention books. But I do think there is something genuinely odd about the way in which our lives are mediated today by apps and phones and by the tech companies whose platforms facilitate our friendships and our sense of what's going on in the world, but at the price of the peddling of our personal data to advertisers and politicians. And Cambridge Analytica and the scandal around it is only the tip of that iceberg, friends. It is only a symptom of a much larger problem with which our culture has not yet come to grips, not to mention the church. But there are a couple of specific ways I think that our habits around technology make abiding in love difficult. 
One is the way that the mediation of the screen gives us an illusion of distance between us and those with whom we're communicating. We say and we do things to one another online that we would never, ever do to one another if we were sitting across from one another in a booth at a restaurant. Not to mention if we were kneeling beside one another at this altar receiving communion. There's something about the illusion of the distance between us by the screen that seems to bring out the worst sort of behavior in us that makes us say and do things we later wish we could unsay and undo. And here's the thing. The cloud never forgets anything. That's the second spiritual challenge, I think. The fact that we now live in an era in which everything is documented and nothing is forgotten. Now, there are real benefits to this. There really are. Instagram especially can help us to keep and to share happy memories right? And Facebook and Twitter have been important platforms on which to call the powerful to account and to keep before us the memory of the evils of history so that we may avoid committing them again. So many of these social media platforms have been voices for voiceless people, people for whom pulpits like this one and other institutions of public trust have historically been rather hard to come by. That said, I think forgetting things is really underrated. I know that most of us, including me, complain about our inability to remember things, but our, our ability to forget things is crucial to being healthy and being able to live a genuinely flourishing human life. To constantly have all of one's life before one, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Every picture of everything that I have ever done, that I ever put on Facebook. That sounds like hell to me, not like heaven. I don't want to remember some of that stuff. And my stuff isn't even that traumatic, it's just embarrassing. It is no mistake that forgetting is a common biblical image for how God forgives our sins. As when God says in Jeremiah, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. This is part of what makes online bullying so insidious. The humiliation is public. And unlike when I got picked on in the playground as a middle schooler, the abuse is memorialized forever. These two, the illusion of distance and perpetual documentation are threats to our capacity to abide in love. But the greatest challenge, I think, is that which is presented to our capacity to abide in anything, love or otherwise. It is the erosion of our sense of self and the attenuation of our capacity to pay and to give attention. I, just don't, I don't just mean being distracted. I mean the sort of attention which is crucial to really seeing something as it is the sort of thing that allows us really to attend to a fine painting, not to mention ourselves. So to illustrate this, I just have to tell you a personal story, and it's not a very, it's a, it's a rather embarrassing one for me. So until last week, I had basically for the past 11 years used my iPhone as my alarm clock. I got the second iPhone that was ever released, the S or whatever it was, and I've been using it as my alarm clock basically ever since. Now like many of yours, my iPhone now reminds me of when to go to bed, and I generally just laugh at it. I never go to bed when it tells me to do, it's a phone. But in the morning, and I did kind of like this, it will gently wake me with a slow crescendo of very pleasing tones. That's really nice. But last week, Last week, I have to tell you, I bought an old-fashioned alarm clock. Okay, not really, it wasn't that old-fashioned. I'm pretty particular. My spouse, Jewel, can tell you about the, the my, uh, mm, I need for things to like look pretty. So I got a mid-century knockoff old-fashioned alarm clock, okay? But it's like one of the real ones. It doesn't even have a snooze button, but it does look very pretty. And I decided to charge my phone at night on the dresser across from our bed, instead of leaving the phone on the dock on my bedside table. 
Now my phone is out of reach both when I go to sleep at night and when I wake up. And I did this because I was stuck in the habit of in the morning, immediately upon waking up, spending an hour or an hour and a half at least on my phone. I'm serious. I've been doing this particular ritual for at least five years. At least since I was in seminary. I don't exactly remember when it started, but it's been a while. Starting my day with news alerts from the night before and with colleagues and friends saying nonsense to one another on Twitter that raises my blood pressure, this was all a recipe for some serious unhappiness. I wanted to get up in the morning. I wanted to do the stuff that Father Peter tells us all to do all the time. Get up in the morning, go meditate, go pray. As a priest, I wanted to, after I meditate, say morning prayer from the prayer book. I wanted to pray for you because that is my vocation and I could not get myself to do it. I was in the chains of my habits. Habits can imprison us as much as empower us. And the work of disarticulating ourselves from the bad ones and learning new ones is pretty hard. It's rigorous spiritual labor. The way I had interacted with my phone had made me unfree. Now this may not be a problem for you. And giving up the phone as, the alarm, as your alarm clock may not be the solution you need. But abiding is incumbent on all of us. And I hope that this week you will take stock of the way you use technology. You can't get rid of it, and it gives us many blessings. But just take stock of it. Do you own it, or does it own you? The 20th century Anglican divine, Evelyn Underhill, knew that we all had to learn to abide. She said that purgation, or the sort of strenuous moral labor that it takes to wrest oneself from vice and to begin to train oneself in virtue. This is what most of the history of Christian thought has considered the first step in becoming a disciple of Christ, purgation. She thought this is actually the second step. The first step is something she called recollection. It's the process by which one gathers up all the shards of your soul and self that are scattered abroad in your day-to-day -day life. All those parts of yourself that claim to be you. The you at work, the you at home, the you in your marriage, the you with your kids, the you with your friends, the you with those you don't like too much, the you that does and says cruel things, your Twitter feed and your Facebook page and your Instagram and your Snapchat stories. You have to gather all of this stuff up. And then in a sustained act of attention or abiding, you have to see it for what it is. And then, and only then, after having actually attained some purchase on yourself, can you begin to try by grace to conform yourself to Christ. That is to abide in love. This interior silence in which we truly and finally touch down on the real is crucial to following Jesus and learning how to do it. In the words of another, a 17th century Anglican divine, Jeremy Taylor, there should be in the soul halls of space, avenues of leisure, high porticos of silence in which God dwells. Friends, take them back. Amen? Amen.